What's up, everyone? Today in What's the Matter, we're going to learn about the 118 building blocks that make up all the matter that exists in the world by learning about their structure and exactly what's inside of those little buggers. So that's right, get yourself in a good positive vibe, get your pen and pad out, let's go to work. The 118 building blocks that make up everything in the world are known as elements or atoms. And each and every atom will consist of the same two basic components, a nucleus and an electron cloud. This means that every atom will have a nucleus, like you see here with the yellow and teal spheres, and an electron cloud, which is shown with the white cloudy circle. So we know everything is made up of atoms, right? Those are the building blocks. But what if I was to say that atoms are made up of something even smaller? Well, yes, I am saying that. Because inside of the nucleus and an electron cloud of every atom consists what is known as subatomic particles. The subatomic particles that make up an atom are called protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus of every atom, while electrons, yes you guessed it, are located somewhere within the electron cloud of an atom. Now, subatomic particles are so, so, so small that they were even given their own unit of mass, which is known as the atomic mass unit, or AMU. The literal mass of both a proton and a neutron is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, or we just use one atomic mass unit. The mass of an electron is even smaller than that, and with the size of 1 2,000th the size of a proton, it contributes virtually nothing to the mass of an atom, and because of that, we give it a value of zero AMUs. Okay, so based on the masses of the subatomic particles and the number of each of them in our atom, we can determine the mass of the atom. But what keeps these subatomic particles locked together in an atom? Now, there's a much more complicated answer than this, but I like to think of it like a couple of magnets and the concept of opposites being attracted to each other. Each of the protons in the nucleus of an atom has a strong nuclear force that both gives it a positive electrical charge of plus one and holds the entire nucleus together. Neutrons contain the same nuclear force that keeps them in the nucleus, but they have an overall electrical charge of zero, or being neutral, and they do not contribute at all to the electromagnetic forces that are also at play in this atom. Electrons, on the other hand, play by their own set of rules. And because they do not contain any nuclear force, they form this cloud around the tiny nucleus of an atom. The electrons in the electron cloud of an atom have an electrical charge that is equal to that of a proton, but opposite in science, giving each electron in the atom a negative one charge. Since opposite charges are attracted to each other, like the two opposite ends of a pair of magnets, the positively charged protons will attract the negatively charged electrons, producing our atom. Each atom or element in its most fundamental form will consist a known amount of each of these three different subatomic particles. This means that scientists over the years have been able to determine the exact number of each subatomic particle in all of our 118 building blocks. The different combinations of the subatomic particles in an atom give that atom its chemical properties that we observe in the matter every day. The subatomic particle whose amount in an atom does not change no matter what and therefore determines the chemical behavior of that element is the proton. So the number of protons in an atom gives that atom its unique identity. And this number is what we use to arrange the different atoms on the periodic table of elements. 
Because of this, the number of protons present in an atom equals what is known as the atomic number of an element. The periodic table of elements is arranged based on the atomic number, and on this periodic table, we see this number in the top left corner of the box for that element. Each element is given a unique chemical symbol, which always has a maximum of two letters, with the first of those letters being capitalized. The symbol is in the center of each box, and the name for that element is usually underneath the symbol. Remember that we said that the mass of each proton and each neutron is basically the same, and that the electrons contribute virtually nothing to the mass of an atom? So if we simply add up and combine the total number of protons and neutrons in an atom, we can then determine what is known as the mass number of an element. Because we are adding up the number of protons and neutrons, the mass number of an element will always be a whole number because the mass number is literally the count of protons and neutrons. But wait a second. If we go back and look at the number underneath the chemical symbol and name on the periodic table, we see that that number is a decimal. That is because the decimal number in the boxes of all the elements on the periodic table belongs to what is known as the atomic mass of an element, and more specifically, the average atomic mass of an element. And we all know that when you calculate an average of something, you are doing so with multiple numbers, which leads to decimals. So this must mean that the average atomic mass of the elements must be a calculation of different masses of that element, right? Well, it turns out that most elements in our world exist in what I like to think of as different versions of themselves. These different versions of an element are known as isotopes, and they are different from each other because of their masses. And because we know that the protons give an element its identity, isotopes of an element are a copy of that element that is either heavier or lighter because it has either more or less neutrons inside of it. Isotopes are used for all types of applications from killing cancer cells and tracing biochemical pathways in medicine to using carbon dating to determine how old fossils are. The different isotopes of an element are also geographically specific, meaning that the different versions of that element are present in different regions of the world. Because different isotopes are present in different regions around the world, Another common use of them are as tracers for different matters such as metals and groundwater, or even to determine migration patterns of animals such as these elephants. What we use to represent each different isotope is called isotopic notation. Each isotope is written as the chemical symbol, like this capital C for the carbon atom, the atomic number can be used and is written in subscript form on the bottom left side of the element, but we do not have to write down the atomic number because we know that all carbon atoms will always have the atomic number of six. In superscript form, at the top left corner of the chemical symbol, we write down the mass number of that specific isotope because that is the number that will be different between the different isotopes of that element. For this example, we are referring to the carbon-12 isotope of the element carbon. We can also represent this by simply using the chemical name with the mass number written right next to it. A common example of some isotopes of an element are the hydrogen isotopes. In the world, there are three versions of the element of hydrogen, and each version has a different number of neutrons in it. But remember, it's hydrogen, so we know that the number of protons in each version is one, which is the atomic number of hydrogen. Hydrogen exists as protium, with that single proton and no neutrons, giving it a mass number of one. Deuterium 
with a mass number of two from one proton and one neutron, and tritium with a mass number of three from one proton and two neutrons. Now, all of the hydrogen in the world is not just 100% of a single one of these isotopes. And we call the different relative amounts of all the isotopes of an element on the planet the natural abundances of that isotope. Along with the relative masses of each isotope, you can use the relative abundances of the isotopes to calculate the weighted average of all of the isotopes for that element. In other words, I can calculate the average atomic mass of that element, which is the number that goes on the periodic table. The formula for calculating the average atomic mass of an element is the sum of the masses multiplied by the natural abundance of each isotope, divided by 100 because we are using percentages. Plugging in our measurements for hydrogen, we can calculate an average atomic mass of the element hydrogen of 1.01 AMUs, or just lowercase u. Finally, based on the natural abundance of each isotope, I can determine which isotope is the most abundant on our planet, which in hydrogen's case is the isotope hydrogen-1. The last piece of understanding atomic structure is based on those electrical charges that we talked about in the protons and electrons of an atom. At standard temperature and pressure, or STP, which is just the natural environment of our planet, atoms are stable with an overall neutral electrical charge of zero. So in the stable, neutral form of our elements, which is the one that is represented on the periodic table, there will always be equal numbers of the positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons. But under certain conditions, the number of electrons in the atom will be different from what the stable form of that element would have, and that type of atom is called an ion. Ions are charged atoms or molecules that carry a charge due to the extra or missing electrons in the atom. Ions are represented using the chemical symbol of that element and a superscript on the top right side of the symbol with the sign and magnitude of the ion's electrical charge. In this example, we have the magnesium ion which carries an electrical charge of plus two because it is missing two electrons compared to its stable form. Well, that does it for today, folks. I hope you have fun and I hope you learned something new. So remember, you matter because you're matter. So really, come on now. What's the matter? Thanks for watching. Have a blessed day.